Hello everyone, Alec Eldrew the SideQuest Gamer here. 100 reviews, thousands and thousands of words typed with scripting, and over hundreds of hours put into scripting and editing. And we're finally at this point in time. The 100th review. The review where I'd say I review my favorite game of all time and explain why I think it's the best game of all the video games I've played in my lifetime. We're finally here. We made it. We made it to this point. Jeez, it's, it's just like, it seemed like yesterday since I uploaded my first review on this channel. On September 7th, 2014, I uploaded my first review on this channel. I didn't really have a set schedule until after my fifth review, which was to get out reviews on a weekly basis, and then I decided to add more than just reviews to the channel, so I created these Crazy Days in Gaming editorial series, and a lot more as time goes on. But my main focus was to always to review video games on this channel, mainly retro games as that's all I can honestly record at the moment. I really wanted to focus on underrated or overlooked retro video games, but that ship has kind of sailed, as I don't see why I couldn't do that in addition to reviewing popular games like the Super Mario Bros. 8-bit games or the Zelda series, especially when there's complaints or praise that I have that I've never heard anyone else mention. And as of September 7th, 2016, I've officially had the SideQuest Gamer Review Show on for two whole years. That's amazing. Thank you all so much for joining me on this very long journey, and I hope you enjoy the rest of this review. Is it any surprise that this is my favorite game of all time? I love the Super Mario platformer series, and this entry is said to either be the best in the series or one of the best. Fans are a little divided on whether this game, Super Mario World, or the two Galaxy games are the best in the series, and while I do like World and the Galaxy games, I find myself coming back to this game the most often because it's just that much fun to me. So after the first game sold 40 million copies, while 2 USA sold 7 million and the Lost level sold only 2 million. Nintendo released the final 8-bit Super Mario game in 1988 in Japan, but wouldn't be localized in America until 1990, selling a whopping 17 million copies worldwide. And the PAL region wouldn't get their copies until 1991. <laughs> The game would have been localized sooner if it weren't for a shortage of ROM chips for the cartridges, and with Japan being a much smaller country than America in terms of population, it makes sense that they get their copies first until supplies are replenished. In 1989, this game did infamously get some advertising in that 80s movie The Wizard, which I've never seen with the exception of the Power Glove and the Unviolin Clips, which have since become internet memes. Super Mario Bros. 3 was developed by Nintendo R&D 4 with over 10 people working on it. Shigeru Miyamoto served as the director of this new project and oversaw production closely during the final and conceptual stages of the game. Instead of simply designing the game to specifically cater to the skill, the designers wanted to implement a difficulty curve that gave players plenty of 1-ups and power-ups with a set of easier challenges in the beginning, but then progressively make the challenges and obstacles harder and harder, so that those who don't want to get frustrated will be taught how to play the game while veterans will still be up for a good challenge. Did they succeed? Yes, they most certainly did. Grassland is your tutorial world, pretty much telling you how to play the game by throwing in challenges that aren't too difficult, but get you into the swing of things as to how this game's levels will be designed. These levels want you to get used to the boost meter that affect your run speed and jump height, which is quite admirable. Sure, you can finish the level on foot, but if you find a feather that gives you a raccoon tail or even a tanuki suit, you can find all sorts of secrets like warp pipes and such, making it easier to beat the level thanks to the ability of temporary flights. And if you're wondering if they brought back the fire flowers from the first game, yes they did! But unlike the first game where if you're fire flower Mario and then get hit, you'd shrink back to small Mario losing two hit points. But now you instead just lose one hit point and reduce to Super Mario instead. Same goes for any power-up that serves as a third hit point like the Hammer Brothers suit and the Frog suits. 
Unless you're playing the Japanese version, but I'm guessing the two year gap gave Nintendo some time for version revisions, one of the rare times Japan got the harder version of an NES game. After you play through the first three or four levels depending on what route you choose, you get to enter the first of many castles where you go through many obstacles and fight an enemy mini-boss known as Boom Boom, which are pretty easy even on my first playthrough. These castles are important for beginners because beating them permanently removes the lock gate in the overworld map, whereas if you get a game over and continue, you can just skip past the levels and castle you beat. I love the introduction of non-linearity in a Mario game, even though as an expert player I tend to play through all the levels just for the heck of it, but make no mistake, you don't have to play through all of the levels to beat the game, although sometimes you're blocked off from some toad houses that have those precious power-ups that'll be ideal for your item submenu that'll allow you to use any acquired power-up in any level you choose, but do choose wisely like using the frog suit in an underwater level, or a raccoon suit in a spacious level where there's plenty of secrets in the sky like otherwise unreachable war pipes housing secret one-ups and transformation suits. That's why I tend to play through all the levels just so I don't miss out on anything useful. Anyways, within the next set of main levels, you'll encounter the Hammer Brothers in the overworld map. Let me tell you, these jerks are nowhere near as bad as they were in the original game, for one thing, their hammer attack patterns don't feel random, and they seem to be a lot slower than they were in the first game. But make no mistake, they're still a threat, but once you effortlessly beat them, you'll get a power-up as a reward. Later on, you'll come across variations of these brothers' encounters like the Boomerang Brothers, the Sludge Brothers, and if you can find them in the second world, the Fire Brothers. They'll occasionally be in regular levels, but they're most commonly found within the map screen itself. I don't recall any normal Hammer Brothers or Fire Brothers being within a main level besides the hand grabbing levels in World 8. I remember seeing two Sludge Brothers in a level in World 4, and the Boomerang Brothers were quite common in Worlds 1 and 2, but most of them just appear in the overworld map itself. After you deal with the post-castle set of levels and the Hammer Brothers encounter, you'll go into the main castle and talk to one of the Toad Advisors for one of the Seven Kings you have to help in this game. Oh yes, in this game, Bowser's minions being the Seven Koopalings each stole a magic wand from each of the Seven Kingdoms in the Mushroom World. Princess Peach sends Mario and Luigi to go help save these kingdoms from the Koopalings' mischief, and so they do! Turns out the Koopalings turn the kings into undesirable animals, but once you talk to the advisor, you hitch a ride on an airship housing the Koopaling holding the king's wand. These airships can get really tricky, especially World 7's airship. The obstacles themselves aren't that hard to dodge, but the auto-scrolling makes it trickier where you have to think fast and hopefully not get behind a solid object when the screen scrolls to the right, or you're dead. You get crushed to death by that solid object. And if you die on these airship levels, you have to chase the airship around the overworld map and would even have to replace some of the levels if, say, you got a game over and the levels were set back to being unbeaten. At the end of the airship is where you fight one of the seven Koopalings, and even though they shoot projectiles at you from their wand, they're pretty easy because you just have to jump on them three times and that's it. They're defeated. You get the wand back, make the airship disappear, and fall to your death holding that wand. Nah, I'm just kidding. You just send back to the King's Castle and turn him back to human or er, toadian? I don't know. He's back to normal and says, Oh, thank heavens, I'm back to my old self. Thank you so much. Here is a letter from the princess. But the question is, how often do the kings get letters from the princess? After getting a letter from the princess which includes an item enclosed that will be added to your submenu, you move on to the next world. World 2 is known as Desert Land, and there's an increase in difficulty. For one, the Micro Mugger Goomba enemies are disguised as boxes and they'll attack you once you're in proximity. They're avoidable, especially since there's a visual tell of which boxes are real and which ones are fake. But on my first playthrough, it did throw me off a little bit. So if you're a first time player, the boxes that are not shiny, are the fake ones, so jump on them to get them out of your life. There's plenty of enemies like the Fire Snakes and the Venus Fire Traps, with the latter being persistent obstacles in the later worlds of the game. This world also introduces the Boos and Thwomp enemies, which will appear in later castle levels in addition to this one. The Boos can be kind of a threat because they'll give chase if you face the opposite direction of them, but the Thwomps and Dry Bones are pretty easy to bypass. 
Level 2-5 introduces one of the scariest enemies, being the Chain Chomp enemies. It's exactly how it sounds, but these things are very aggressive. Be extremely careful when you're near them. But, but who at Nintendo thought merging a dog with a cannonball would sound like a good idea? That thing is freaky! And just you wait until Yoshi's Island and Super Mario 64 when they introduce the big ones. <laughs> Oh, jeez. There's also the Angry Sun from 2 Quicksand, where you have to not only beat the level in 200 seconds, but you also have to avoid the Angry Sun while doing so. This enemy only shows up twice in the entire game, but my heart does race when it's nearby. World 2 Pyramid introduces level design that is kind of maze like, with the goal being to break the box blockades with a Buzzy Beetle shell, and I really like that idea. You can also break the boxes with the Raccoon Tail if you do have it, but if not, you can carry the shell to the boxes and break them the harder way. It is a fresh change of pace that will show up occasionally in some form in the later worlds. And when you finally reach the airship level of World 2, it introduces the Rocky Wrench enemies whose projectile wrenches are not hard to avoid, but I do find myself touching the wrenches by accident sometimes. So beat Morton Koopa Jr., who isn't that much harder than Larry, with the exception that he's bigger and fires his wand more often, but he's still pretty easy nonetheless. World 3 being Oceanside was really challenging for me on my first playthrough as Nintendo R&D 4 decided to introduce the player to the brand new water physics that you only get a taste of in previous worlds. I used to think it's one of my least favorite worlds in the game, but it's grown on me over time. The first level is almost completely underwater, and I hope you do get reacquainted with the fish and blooper enemies as now they're joined by the lava reefs just to make your journey underwater all the more challenging. And honestly, I think these underwater levels are pretty fun, especially if you're wearing the frog suit. I like the look of the dark water and the music goes really well with it. There are more underwater levels throughout the game like 3-5 where you're introduced to the Gelectro enemies that can't be killed for some reason, and 3-4 Fortress 2 which have those weird stretch platforms. But these underwater levels are few in this game, but they're all the more special because of it. This world mainly has your grass levels, but more notably has the jumping fish obstacles that can easily take hit point off you if you're not careful, and of course there's the terrifying giant fish which can instantly kill you if you're not careful. The trick is to stay on high ground by any means necessary, like triggering a vine box with a loose ricocheting Koopa shell, or just to kill the fish with a fire flower, but be wary of it respawning in just a few seconds. This fish gave me a few game overs on my first playthrough, but once you know what to do, you can manage this spike in difficulty. This world also introduces flying boom booms in the castle levels, where instead of it hopping madly in its second phase, it instead flies over you and then dives at you. But again, if you're like me, hop on it before it forms its wings in its second phase. After you go through all those levels, go to the King's Palace, our king has been blah blah blah, hitch a ride on the airship, go through the hard torch obstacles, and fight Wendy Okupo significantly harder than the previous two as her magic wand attack form ricocheting hoops that stick around. I recommend taking her out quickly, or you're gonna have one heck of a time trying to pay attention to the bounce patterns of the deadly hoops while trying to jump on Wendy. Defeat her, restore the king, move on to the next world. World 4 known as Big Island seems to be everyone's favorite world, and it's very unique, I'll give it that. The enlarged Koopas, Piranha Plants, and Goombas coexisting with the giant boxes had a really unique challenge to this world. It may feel easier than the previous world, but Oceanside does have more levels in it, making it feel more challenging, but not exactly more challenging. Not to mention Big Island's fortress stages are harder than the previous worlds. Even some of the main stages like 4-2 and 4-3 has some instances of tricky obstacles, like the return of the jumping fish and the two Sledge Brothers, respectively. Not to mention the map is filled with the Sledge Brothers encounters, which can shatter the ground, stunning you in place while you take damage from the thrown hammers. They can be dealt with easily if you use the invincibility star or fire flower abilities, or learn when and how to jump on top of them without taking any damage. Like Oceanside, this world has two fortress levels, and after you beat all the fortress and regular levels, you go to the fourth airship and face off against Iggy Koopa, and he's easier than Wendy as he goes back to using the magic attack Morton and Larry use, but is really fast and jumps a lot more often. Defeat him, restore the king, move on. World 5 known as Skyland, or The Sky, despite a good portion of it taking place on ground with a Mario game, so whatever, is definitely my personal favorite in the game. It's probably because of how much the rarely used sky aesthetic makes this world feel so fresh when compared to the others, although replaying the levels just gave me a sense of enjoyment like no other. Of all the worlds in the game, this is probably the most bombless pit heavy next to the final world. Of course, that's a given for this is Skyland. 
One of the more notable levels in the game is 5-3 for one reason, Kerbu Shu, and it's honestly the most overpraised power-up in the game. I mean, after hitting a block underneath a Shu Goomba and then riding that Shu for the rest of the level, I don't really see why many people love this power-up as much as they do. It's a neat idea, but it's used for only one level and just makes it slightly easier since now you can hop about on the Black Piranha Plants. I could honestly play through the level just fine without it. Now, if it were used in more levels and I could use it anywhere in the game, I might appreciate it more, but the fact of the matter is that it's not and it was just fun while it lasted. What I like about this world is that if you beat the first fortress, a bridge will form above the water instead of a gate unlocking, and after getting through the usual, you enter a spiral tower which is kind of like a fortress level except there is no boss, and the exit leads you to the second half of this world, being the sky portion. This is where all the sky based levels are and they're really fun, although you do have to time the spinning platforms correctly or get flung into the bottomless pit. My favorite level is 5-6 where there's flying beetle shells that ascend when you hop on top of them. It's just a fresh platforming gimmick that I highly appreciate. Although, there are two levels that have Lakitu enemies, and if you thought they were hard in the first game, they're trickier since the spinies they throw bounce off the ground upon impact. They show up in previous levels and in future levels, but they do pose as one of the higher threats in the game. Go to the Sky King's Palace, board Roy Koopa's ship, go through the obstacle course, and face Roy Koopa. Now, Roy, unlike the previous Koopalings, is very heavy and can make the ground shatter, kind of like a sludge bro. And yes, it does paralyze Mario temporarily. Now, in addition to that, Roy fires magic and jumps around. This this is a significantly harder boss, but he's not that hard to defeat. After that, get Wand, change King back with Magic Wand, moving on. World 6, Iced Land. This world, like the name suggests, is filled with ice physics, and some people found this world really challenging. I honestly don't find it much harder than the fifth world, and the ice physics are well done. There are quite a number of enemies you have to overcome, most notably the new Patui enemies, and of course there's your standard Koopas and Goombas, but I really like this world. On the map, there's a lot of optional non-linearity, like the rocks you can break with a hammer, allowing you to skip a few levels, and there's even a fork in the row where you can either play 6-5 or 6-6. 6-5 is a puzzle based level where you can get the raccoon tail or tanuki suit equipped and then carry the shell to one of the gaps in the ceiling and kill the white piranha plants and your reward would be going to the mushroom house that would be otherwise inaccessible without a cloud item. But this level I sure didn't figure out the solution for on my first few playthroughs. I always played 6-6 instead which is a semi underwater level but now I can do 6-5 with little to no problem as I know what to do. What is unique about this world is that some ice blocks have coins and enemies in them and to thaw them out you can equip a fire flower ability and use your flames to melt the ice and get those coins. This is one of the longer worlds in the game, so long it has three fortress levels now. At least the mushroom houses have hammer suits that Mario can use to take out literally any enemy including ghost swamps and even stretches. It's kind of odd that the Boo's only weakness is either an invincibility star or a hammer. And I really don't buy the latter. I mean, why would a solid object that's not a Christian cross kill the boo? It doesn't make any sense, but it's a Mario game. Nothing in its universe makes any remote sense. At the end of this world, you fight Lemmy Koopa, who is easier than Roy because he deploys balls from his magic wand that you can bounce off the tops of. Land 3 hits on Lemmy, King's back to normal, moving on. World 7, Pipe Maze, and like the name suggests, it's a maze of pipes spanning several divided islands. Instead of your typical Hammer Brothers, now there's these Piranha Plants mini-levels, which can be really tricky for first-timers, but time the black plants carefully, or just use an invincibility star, you'll get by and be rewarded for it. This is probably my least favorite world in the game, mainly because it's the longest one and how almost every level in the world is labyrinthian in design, and there is one instance where you have to go in the right pathway. Let's just say the easier of the two levels is the wrong way to go, as it'll lead to an island with just a lone warp pipe and a dead end. Want an opportunity to get a ton of extra lives in this world? Spend like 10 minutes hitting the fourth block and getting all the coins in the first fortress level. 100 coins means one extra life. When the boxes reappear, exit, then re-enter the room and repeat the process until you have your desired amount of lives. And trust me when I say it'll be really useful for what's to come. But hey, it's not cheating if it's in the game.
After dealing with some of the hardest obstacles in the game, you go to the palace, board Ludwig von Koopa's airship, which is the hardest Koopaling airship in the game, and then face off against Ludwig. He is by far the hardest of the Koopalings because not only does he shake the ground when landing, he's also very fast moving, kind of like Roy and Aki formed into one boss. Take him out quickly, and with the seven Koopalings now, you save the kingdoms from their mischief, and the Koopa army is no longer a threat to the seven kingdoms of the Mushroom World. The king gives you a letter from the princess, probably congratulating you and awaiting Mario and Luigi's return, right? Not exactly. Skip to this point of the video because I'm going to talk about a predictable Shyamalan twist that we all pretty much saw coming, but I don't want to be called out in the comments section for not giving a spoiler warning because we all know how deep the lore of the Mario universe really is. Turns out the letter is not from the princess, but King Bowser himself because he's kidnapped her while Mario and Luigi were busy dealing with the seven Koopalings. Eustace, this is all a diversion! Welcome to the 8th and final world, excluding the Warp World. Dark Land, or Castle of Koopa as it's known in this version specifically, this world is like a mix of Hell and the Mushroom Kingdom, especially since the fourth section of the world containing Bowser's castle has mushrooms around it. Is this the Mushroom Kingdom reformed in Bowser's image? The GBA remake kind of suggests the latter, as light does come through the window. Heck, Peach's room even looks like her castle. Why else would there be two convoys of tanks, a fleet of airships, and a battle boat? Does that mean those skulls are the skulls of toads? They're not based off reptilian physiology, so... But it's just a Mario game, let's not think deeply about it and move on. As I mentioned, this world's lacking in regular levels, although the ones that are there are the hardest levels in the game, with the harder of the two being 8-1. For 8-2, just go into the first pit of quicksand and it'll take you to two shortcut warp pipes that'll get you through a great portion of the level. Good luck facing a bullet bill in heavy 8-1, it's still a challenge for me even with multiple playthroughs. That and the airship level because the screen auto scrolls so fast and there's rocky wrench projectiles everywhere. The two tank levels, the battleship and the airship levels give you quite the challenge at first but I'm able to get by the cannonballs and bob -omb enemies with little to no problem. And those weird handsy levels that pull you in randomly are semi optional but you are rewarded with a raccoon leaf if you finish them. The castle before the final one will be really hard on your first playthrough, but my tip to you is to bring a power up, and the blue switch spawned from the box next to the treadmill will open a doorway to the boom boom enemy. Once you're at Bowser's final castle, mind the statues as some of them will shoot out lasers from their eyes. There's also plenty of callbacks to the first Mario game, like the appearing flames, and that Bowser's on a bridge, but a different one than the one we know because he's actually smart enough to change his strategy, unlike his new Super Mario Bros. appearances. He's really challenging as not only will he shoot out flames, but he'll do a jump stomp like the one you'll see in Super Smash Bros. Melee and Brawl, which is what the down special move is based off of. Credits to Smash and Compare team for that information. Go check out their Bowser episode, by the way. Anyways, get Bowser to break the three sections of the same column on the bridge, and he'll fall to the bottomless pit, defeating him. You can also use a hammer suit or fire flower, defeating him without breaking the sections of the bridge, but I tend to lose those before entering the final battle. With Bowser defeated, you go into the room, and to your surprise, a woman who looks like Princess Peach tells you that the princess is indeed in another castle, just like the toads in the original and Lost Levels games. All that hard work for nothing! <laughs> oh wait, she was just kidding. And she's laughing at me. Oh. Well, that's embarrassing. At least the princess is saved and we get a neat reminder of the incredible journey we had with the credits reel. Although some of these worlds have weird names in the NES version, like the entire lava country was simply called Castle of Koopa, despite only one of four sections having Bowser's castle. I know, it's just a Mario game, I can't question it's insane logic, blah blah blah. When looking at each world individually, there's really nothing I can complain about as even my least favorite levels have a lot of fun to be had. This game isn't brutally hard, but it does have some challenges that the player has to bypass, and they're not impossible by any means. 
but if there's a set of levels that are challenging, well there are mini game opportunities offered to the player where they can score some extra lives. Not to mention if you beat 3 levels in a row, you can at least get 1 up by hitting the end level box. The game is not overly generous with 1 ups as you'll still have to earn the bigger prizes by hitting all 3 stars for a 5 up or playing a matching game of scrolling pictures that you have to stop at the right times. There's even a memory game that allows for the player to not only get 1 ups but power ups for their overworld item menu, so your journey shouldn't be too difficult. Why is this the best game of the hundreds of video games I've played in my lifetime? Because it simply has me going back to it the most, and even my least favorite levels are pretty well designed. For one, the power-ups not only have the best variety, but their functions are the most fun to utilize in certain situations. Not only that, but you have the freedom to choose when and where you should use these power-ups. The Fire Flower is still just as fun to use as it was in the original game in Lost Levels, but the Raccoon Tail and the Tanuki Leaf just allow for a whole new dimension of level design. Some secrets are in the sky, like shortcuts or places you can even get a useful power-up from. I do like the Tanuki Suit, but I don't often use Statue Mode as often because I never really felt the dire need to use it. It does prevent you from taking damage from enemies, but only for a few seconds before returning back to normal Mario. The statue ability is kind of a nice callback to Japanese culture, as a tanuki is not a raccoon, contrary to popular belief, but rather a subspecies of raccoon dog native to Japan, and the statue form is mainly a callback to the popularity of those weird statues based on this breed of raccoon dog. Although, I am glad they removed the lower mid-section that's common with these Japanese statues that, let's just say, is not exactly PG. The hammer suit allows for you to throw hammers, and it's pretty rare but so much fun to use on otherwise unstoppable enemies, but some of the best power-ups are the ones you can use on the map. There is the anchor which keeps an airship in place, but I was never able to trigger the white mushroom house needed to get it. The hammer allows for some shortcuts to be made on the map by breaking rock formations. The P-Wings are like getting the Raccoon Tail except that your boost meter is always full for the rest of the level, which allows you to skip a great portion of the level if not the entire level. The clouds let you skip levels completely on the map, but the most talked about item is the Warp Whistles. There's only three in the entire game with two of them being in the first world and the last being held by the Hidden Fire Brothers behind that rock formation in World 2 you would otherwise dismiss as a background decoration, but they let you skip several worlds and if you collect two and use them at once, you can even go to World 8 without doing the previous worlds. So while there's infinite continues in the game after you get a game over, you still have to beat this game in one sitting. I'm hypothesizing that the warp whistles were a quick way of allowing the player to pick up where they left off, which is further supported by the fact that the first two could be acquired in only the first world. Another reason why I love this game so much is because Mario is so much fun to control. Now I did hear complaints that the controls are not only slippery but the jumps are also floaty. However, the controls are based on momentum physics and if you just run at full speed to the right and not try to decrease the speed of your stop by holding left, of course they'll be slippery. But they're a lot better than all three of the previous entries combined. I've never even died due to some minor control issues which I can't exactly say the same for the three previous entries. Mario in the original game in Lost Levels had really stiff jumps that forced you to be really precise of when and where to do a run jump and when to not, and a lot worse if you played as Luigi in the Lost Levels since he has very little traction on the ground. Super Mario Bros. 2 USA controlled better, but characters like Luigi and Toad had some instances where I miscalculated a jump and lost a hit point, and throwing an item doesn't always land in the desired location, but Super Mario Bros. 3 just does everything right for me control-wise. I think it's very satisfying to pick up a blue box and fling them at multiple enemies as well as the high jumps allowing me to land a hit in the desired location like for the fights against the Koopalings and the Boom Boom enemies. And the momentum gameplay just makes it all the more satisfying when you master it. It does take some getting used to but once you do, you'll be able to do incredible things like speedrun a level, kind of like a Sonic game except unlike Mario, Sonic was never good. <laughs> I'm kidding, I'm kidding, don't get your Green Hill Rock formations in a twist. Are the controls slippery? No, unless you're talking about World 6, then of course, it's ice physics. But the controls are based off momentum. 
Are the jumps floaty? Yes, and I think they make the game better. They're not too floaty where you feel you'll lose control in midair, but just about the right amount of floaty where you can still maintain control over Mario or Luigi. Speaking of Mario and Luigi, there is a multiplayer option where you and a friend can play the game together, although instead of having to wait for the other player to die as they marathon several levels and you still have to go through the levels they went through, Nintendo made it so that not only do you not have to play through the levels they beat and vice versa, but they made it so that you would have a turn if the other player dies or finishes a level. But if the other player gets a game over, the levels they beat no longer count as beaten, and they would have to start at the beginning of the map, but you get to keep going until you get a game over and then have to start back at the beginning of the map. This makes playing with a friend so much more fun and so much less rage inducing as opposed to looking at your more skilled friend enviously as they beat the first world without losing lives while you're still on the first level. When one player beats the world boss, you both move on to the next world. And while I'm not the most fond of the turn-based 2 player, Super Mario Bros. 3 has proved to be the exception, not the rule. I remember having my friends over at my house and we all took turns playing Super Mario Bros. 3 co-op with my friends passing the controller. We made it through the first two worlds before it was time for cake. It was my birthday after all. But is there any control differences between Mario and Luigi in this version? The answer is no. Luigi is basically a palette swap of Mario with the same exact abilities, but it does even that out. Super Mario Bros. 2 USA and Lost Levels fans may be disappointed that the Green Plumber lost his uniqueness, but provided those games were one player only games, an aspect I forgot to mention in my reviews of those games, so sorry. Giving Luigi the same exact abilities understandably doesn't give one player an advantage over the other. And as for versus mode, well, it's basically like the Mario Bros. arcade game, where the goal is to get rid of the incoming gauntlet of enemies. It's fun, but nothing really special, and I spent about 10 minutes on it before getting bored and moving on to the actual game. I do appreciate that the option is there though, as it's a fully functional mini game if you and your friend are the competitive type. But unfortunately, my friends and I have spent so much time on the mountains meditating and coming to the spiritual realization that competition is the cause of all human suffering and therefore we only play video games cooperatively. <laughs> This game stands out as the pinnacle of the Mario series because there's not really another entry like it. I mean, sure, 3D Land and New Super Mario Bros. 2 tried to make nostalgic comebacks with the Raccoon Leaf, but they didn't really feel the same and I would have preferred if those games tried their own thing instead of call back to Super Mario Bros. 3. Super Mario Bros. 3's story is even different than the rest of the series. In almost every Mario game, Bowser kidnaps the princess, stop him, and save her. Period. The end. However, the majority of the game doesn't even have that plot point because the first seven worlds involves Mario and Luigi being sent out by the princess to stop the seven Koopalings and the seven mushroom countries in the mushroom world. Ending spoiler, skip to this point here if you even care. Peach doesn't even get kidnapped until the end of the game, but even her kidnapping has a clever premise. Bowser seemed to intentionally cause the seven Koopalings to wreak havoc as kind of a diversion to keep Mario and Luigi distracted while he just swoops in and takes her away. While the ending isn't exactly going to win any awards, I do feel this simple plot is a little more complex than most of the platformer series. It gives the player an incentive to play the game until the end and rewards the player with an incredible journey for doing so. I also really love the graphics and music of this game and I think they hold up pretty well by today's standards. The graphics are in a very detailed and colorful cartoon style that Mario is known for. The Super Mario Bros. 3 cartridge utilizes an MMC3 chip enhancement to render animated sprite tiles a scanline timer to allow for the gameplay to be displayed simultaneously with the status bar below, and even the ability to have diagonal scrolling in some levels. While we take gameplay additions like diagonal scrolling in the status bar for granted today, it does go to show this game did push the limits of the NES, even in terms of graphics. This was impressive for a game released in the late 80s to early 90s, depending on the region you live in. Although there is a popular internet hypothesis that this entire game is in fact a stage play and is therefore non-canon, due to the stylistic stage looking set up from boxes bolted to the background, to cardboard bushes, and even the game beginning and ending with curtains drawing. 
I do think that this game is only a stage play by aesthetics only, because to say that it's not canon for that reason would also have to apply to Zelda 2 since the ending has a curtains draw at the end for that game as well. This game is canon, especially since many of the game's elements like the Koopalings and airships do show up in later entries like Super Mario World and New Super Mario Bros. Wii and Beyond. And I don't know if it's me, but I feel like this aesthetic style might have inspired the Paper Mario series, with the cardboard backgrounds and even Mario and Luigi sprite designs looking kind of similar to Paper Mario and Paper Luigi's paper design. My hypothesis is kind of supported by how there's even a remix of the Grassland map theme playing in the level up screen. Speaking of music, it was composed by Koji Kondo and he did a really good job with the soundtrack as well. I love how each of the 8 maps have their own unique themes with my favorite being the Iceland theme and the Grassland theme. Grassland is very upbeat and Iceland kind of has an arctic feel which is impressive for an 8-bit chip tune. I'm not the biggest fan of Desert or Pipe Maze themes as they kind of put me to sleep if that makes any sense. But as for the chip tunes and the levels themselves, the ground theme is alright. It's a fun little tune to listen to, but its melody and percussion don't feel complex enough and kind of awkwardly paced. The athletic theme, however, is a very fun song that's fast paced and gets you in the mood for some quick platforming. This song is one of the more recognizable songs in the franchise as it does get remixed for the pianist ghost in Luigi's Mansion and even used in Super Mario Galaxy. There's also a remix of the Super Mario Bros. 1 underground theme and it's much better because they add some percussion in addition to the main melody, which just adds so much more to the already fine track. The water and sky themes are slower paced but reasonably paced to give off a sense of atmosphere given to their respective level themes. And the airship theme is amazing, as it's kind of in a militaristic marching band style and only goes on to convey the power of the Koopalings invading airship. I do prefer the Mario Galaxy remix, but I like this 8-bit version in its own right. There may be a lot of soundtracks in the NES that are more worth your time, but I think this is the best soundtrack in the Super Mario Bros. 8-bit quadrilogy, mainly because of its variety of Raid A chiptunes. And really, that's why this game matters to not only me, but to a lot of people as well. This, out of all the games I played, is the best game I Some games came really close, like all the entries on my top 20 favorite games list, but none could just top the lasting appeal Super Mario Bros. 3 had for me. I love Super Mario Galaxy 2 and Super Mario World well enough, but as amazing as those games are, Galaxy 2 could lose some of its steam when you go for the green stars, and Super Mario World has some really annoying puzzles when going for all the alternate exits. I'll get to those games at some point, but if you really want me to be completely honest about what Mario game I like as the overall experience, there's not really any flaws I can find other than, look, a blue bar to the left of the screen. That makes the game totally unplayable, 0 out of 10. And I guess difficulty spikes like in 3-8 could be mentioned as a flaw, but I'm really digging deep trying to find something to complain about. Not an invalid complaint, but some things bother people more than others, and they just don't really bother me that much. Even with me explaining why I love this game as much as I do, I don't recommend you expect to feel the same way as much as I do about the game. I had neutral expectations at first, but over time I grew to love the game more and more as I played it over and over. You might have really high expectations that will make it hard for the games to live up to, especially if platformers aren't your favorite genre. But for a few dollars on the 3DS eShop or the Wii U eShop, I can't recommend this game enough for a download. At least try it out. This is the best game I've ever played, and if there's anything to take away from this review, I love the graphics, I love the music, this game has the most fun power-ups to use, every level feels fresh and new, the progression is good, and despite it not having a save system, the infinite continues and the opportunities to get 1-ups make this a pretty challenging but fair game to play through. It would get my final rating of a 99. 9999999999 out of 100, the highest numerical rating I've given to a game. While no game is perfect, making the 100 value unreachable, some games come really close to it for some people, and this is my closest to perfection video game. Speaking of which, it's time I retire the numerical system because lately many people care too much about a number and not enough about the actual review. I will definitely replace it with like a 30 point verbal tier system just so some people who want a rating will get it, but the review will still have something to take out of it instead of the numerical value. The number system had a great run, but when you find something that will be more convenient, you have to upgrade and make it simpler but more user friendly. I'll update you on how it will work. But what about the legacy that Super Mario Bros. 3 left behind? 
With Super Mario Bros. 3 selling 17 million copies worldwide, it also happened to be released a year before the SNES console launch. Elements like the overworld map were used in games like Super Mario World and the new Super Mario Bros. games. However, Super Mario World had its own unique take that made it feel more like an open overworld as opposed to a segmented overworld like in Super Mario Bros. 3. I do prefer the segmented one in 3 because there's more going for it like Hammer Brothers encounters, mushroom houses, and mini game houses. It felt like anything can happen. And the success of this game seemed to spawn a cartoon called The Adventures of Super Mario Bros. 3. I wonder how that is. Now that my brilliant plan is complete, it's time for you kids to be zapped back to normal size! Oh, we're having such fun being sneaky lions eating giant ninja koopas. Couldn't we stay like this and go capture a couple more kingdoms? That's a cruel, rotten, disgusting idea. And I love it! <laughs> um, okay. Well, it's not the worst animated program I've seen in my lifetime. But it's not winning any awards. It's a lot better than the Super Show, but that's not really saying much. Yeah, I haven't watched all 26 story segments, so this might get its own video sometime. And that's all I have to say about Super Mario Bros. 3, the video game sequel to end all sequels. I really appreciate you for taking the time to watch this behemoth of a video as well as sticking with me for this long. It isn't easy to run a channel for this long and I'm constantly trying new things to not only keep the audience retention but to keep myself from burning out. Now I will review Super Mario World eventually, probably by the end of this year, but I'm kind of Mario'd out at the moment but it will come eventually. And for those asking what I think about the Super Mario All-Stars Remake Collection, well, this isn't the last part of the marathon. Tune in next week for the finale of the 8-Bit Mario Marathon, even though the remakes are not 8-Bit games, as I review that collection. And I do have quite a bit to say about that one, where I'll look at each game individually. And that's it. That's my review of Super Mario Bros. 3. This is why it's my favorite video game of all time. 100 reviews down, but it's not even over. I mean, this is supposed to have some finality to it, but I just realized this is only really the beginning. I mean, two years is not really a long time. It is for YouTube standards, but not a really long time. I will continue my journey reviewing games as I'm constantly thinking of games I want to talk about. I'm constantly playing new games I, I really want to talk about. So be sure to join me next week. Same time, same YouTube channel. But again, I thank you all so much for joining me for this special occasion. As always, remember to stay awesome. Cut!